All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's episode titled The Toxic Culture, where we're going to talk about how we can show up as sales professionals to create an environment that is not only safe and sustainable, but also productive. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce a good friend of mine, Jeff Risley. Jeff, thanks for being here, man. Yeah, happy to be here, Damien. Um, I'm pumped with uh, everything that you're doing around sort of mental health and stress and sales performance. So excited to be a guest and and hopefully uh, hopefully contribute to to what you're building here. It's really cool. For sure, man. No, and I think you know you're an individual that immediately came to mind when I thought about launching this podcast, somebody that I knew I had to get on at some point, because in my opinion, I think you have been and continually do uh, a lot of the work to lead the charge in this space around mental health and sales. And I think, you know, I think back to like four years ago when we were on LinkedIn and, you know, COVID was all happening. There was a lot of these topics that you were kind of posting about that, that weren't talked about anywhere close to what they're being talked about right now, things like burnout and, you know, just understanding um, a little bit more around the importance of the mental uh, performance components within selling. So I think, you know, there's so much insight and so much that we can talk about uh, on various topics. But, you know, today, I think one topic that would be really, really beneficial to discuss is that kind of you know toxic culture element that many people do experience uh, within their sales environment. But before we jump into all that, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about you, your story, uh, and then we can uh, dive into some of those specifics. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, just so, so, so some context for, for everyone listening. So I, uh, I'm i the founder of the Sales Health Alliance. I started, uh, or I am a former salesperson myself. So I started in sales probably about 14 years, 13, 14 years ago now. Um, had my own real struggles with anxiety, um, insomnia. I get these really nasty panic attacks in the middle of the night. And even though I was a top performer, there was that mental piece that was really just taking a huge toll on me individually. And it was after the third panic attack in the hospital when I realized that I needed to do something differently. And I'd found this career that I really enjoyed when it comes to sales, you know, the learning, the growth, the money you can make, the friendships that you build. Mm -hmm. There was so much I liked about the career, but if I wanted to stay in sales, I need to figure out a way to make myself more mentally resilient. And going to therapy 10 years ago was still high, highly stigmatized. I tried some medication for two to three months and I really did like how it made me feel. So I just went down this sort of self exploration, personal growth path of learning everything I could around mental health, stress, and what are others doing to perform under pressure in these high pressure situations. And I just started implementing some things for myself and I didn't really share it with anyone. And then sort of the genesis number two of sort of my career and exploration into mental health and sales was happened or happened back in July of 2018. I just launched my first sales consulting website. And three days after I launched the website, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. So life through this like crazy curveball that I wasn't ready for, but it was through that experience when I realized the same strategies I was using to take care of my mental health and sales, I naturally executed on during this next stressful period of my life. And as I started to explore what I was going to do next, I think that's when you and I connected. I essentially just started writing about my experience with mental health and sales and stress and burnout, what I was doing to navigate the emotional ups and downs. And the more I wrote about it, the more it became clear that one, anxiety and sales is not optional. It's really part of everyday life. It resonates with sellers. And when teams become anxious, depressed, and burnt out, the performance really starts to suffer. And two, as I started to write, there was a growing need for this as content that I was writing turned into asking companies ask me to come speak, to doing training sessions, to doing all sorts of stuff with teams over the next couple of years going forward. So it's been a pretty cool journey that kind of happened organically. No, it's an amazing, an amazing story. And thanks for, you know, sharing that. I think that's really amazing insight and, and vulnerability to the sense that like, I know when people are listening to that, they'll, they'll be able to relate, especially to some of those anxiety pieces. Like, you know, I always say it's not a matter of if you will be stressed, it's a matter of when and are you prepared for that? And mm -hmm. I think it's still something that a lot of sales professionals are learning to accept and, and understand that it is okay to experience this. And it's just about building that that toolkit to navigate it. And that's exactly kind of what a lot of the work that we both do is around, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's beautiful because, you know, it's still not talked about enough. It's still clearly not prioritized enough. 
Um, so it's amazing, man. And I guess just tying that into the theme today, then around, you know, toxic cultures in, in, in sales, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that as like a general topic, um, maybe first thoughts slash, um, you know, things that kind of come to mind when you hear about a toxic sales environment. Yeah, I think over the, the last couple of years, I think this is, um, like it's a systemic issue and what I'm learning or what I have learned is it's, it's very easy to like blame a toxic culture on a leader creating that. And I think it's, it's tough. I really do feel for sales leaders, especially right now who are being stretched a million different directions, pushing their sales team, sellers who are struggling with their own mental issues and challenges and I think it really comes down to just a lack of training. And there's things that are fundamentally broken with how sales teams have been taught and managers have been taught to drive performance that is just counterproductive to what humans need to perform at a high level, what they need to buffer stress that really goes against, you know, decades of new research that's starting to come out that really says, you know, Things like running dopamine-driven incentives and gamification or using fear as a management tool, things that were quote-unquote proven or used to be proven back in you know the early 90s and before, all of the new research and the data is actually saying, well, that's actually wrong. Like The more you extrinsically motivate someone, the less intrinsically motivated they're going to be. The more you prioritize things like safety and creating psychological safety, the more effective that person is going to be at navigating things like setbacks and difficult emotions. They're going to feel supported and connected. So it's we're in this weird position right now where everything that has been ingrained in sales culture for decades upon decades upon decades, it's still existing and it's creating toxicity because everyone is kind of waking up slowly to say, no, this doesn't feel right. Like, no, this isn't how to manage stress. No, this isn't how people perform at a high level. So we're just at the start of leaders and sellers being like, we got it wrong. Like, Mm -hmm. and now we have to change it. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful. And I think there's a lot of leaders that would agree with that as well. But to your point, it's maybe not knowing what to do, right? It's it's mm-hmm. not really knowing. It's like, okay, so yeah, like things things aren't great. You know, my sales team, I might have a bit of a toxic culture, like, but I don't know what to do about it, you know? And I think there's a lot of people in that situation. They're trying their best, their best but um, they don't know what to do about it personally. They don't know how to fix it. They don't know how to create that culture, maybe that um, in their mind they can see, but they they just don't know the steps. So I think that'd be a fun little topic to to kind of dive into within that is is how to create this and and maybe some ways you can identify that toxic culture a little bit too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of the traditional methods to your point that were successful in the 90s, even concepts like PIPs, you know, we think that that's going to drive uh, an increased performance, but, you know, we're seeing the opposite effect, um, you know, and, and a good analogy I think of too, is like, I remember when I played soccer growing up as a kid, I had a couple coaches that believed in me and they were like, just go out there on the field and, and do your thing. We believe that you're going to have a good game today. And then I had some coaches that every move I made was criticized. So mm-hmm. I got to the point where I was scared to do anything because I thought I would make a mistake. So like my passes became worse. My performance became even worse. And I actually got cut off that team. And looking back on it, you know, I talked to a lot of people and they're like, man, like what happened? You're a good player. You should be able to be on that team. And I was like, I just was so in my head and overthinking everything I was doing that I wasn't able to perform to my best. And that analogy really, really applies, I think, to to being a sales professional as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, again, I resonate with that quite a bit. Like as, again, I was playing sports growing up and I was playing high level hockey for a little bit and then basketball. And yeah, I had coaches that yelled and screamed and, and then there were others that really focused on, you know, the learning and growth that comes, you know, from experiencing setbacks. But I think the thing that you said that, that really resonated with me is, is there's just something special about, you know, 
playing on a team or working for a manager who like truly believes in you, who, yes. who, who, who like, you know, intrinsically believes that you're going to, you're there for the right reasons. Yes. There's going to be moments when you don't perform as well, but if, you know, they offer that unconditional support as opposed to letting their own anxiety, their own fear creep into that relationship, um, to help you work on your weaknesses, spend more time on your strengths. Like it, it's a total game changer. And those are the people that you really, you know, remember it for the rest of your career. I have one, I have one client that was, that I've worked with and I, and I just love their leadership, their leadership perspective and sort of their mission, which is every leader within this organization is aligned on. We want to make sure that we are the best stop in this person's career, whether mm. that's six months, two years, three years, their perspective is how do we make this the best experience for them? as long as they're working with us. And when you approach it from that type of perspective, from that value-based vision type of approach to your leadership style across an entire organization, that changes all the decisions that you're making. Things like pips become questionable. Mm -hmm. Things like, you know, playing with commission checks and, you know, not paying sellers becomes questionable, but then you'll start looking for other things. Like I said, going back to things like psychological safety and creating career pathing that's motivating, building connections, like all of that stuff becomes way more important when you just shift that mindset across an entire leadership team. Mm -hmm. It sounds so simple. But I think there is a lot of things that can get in the way of that. And I think mm -hmm. to your point, like leadership might have fear around, you know, not hitting numbers or, or performance not being where it should be. And I think that can kind of cripple, uh, maybe not even intentionally, but that care or, or desire to, to help the individual succeed. Uh, and, and I've seen that happen sometimes as well, where it's just there's so much happening, especially now in tech, right? There's so much uh, maybe that is not going how it used to, and it, it can really overwhelm and kind of, um, you know, fog up the the mirror, if you will, in terms of what really is important. And I think, you know, we, we as people also feel that very deeply when someone does believe in us, and that's probably when we will perform at our best. So I guess, what would you say, man, maybe we can just discuss this, like to, you know, the leader out there that now they want to they want to be there for their team but there's just so much stuff right now that has them occupied they're stressed mm -hmm. out they're worried about they need the team to be accountable they need them to hit their number it's not that they don't care about the person but it's just not the first priority that that blend i guess what, what how would you approach that yeah so you and i both know we're we're sort of or we are big into taking care of ourselves and the importance of mental health and stress and foundationally at an individual level when it comes to managing stress and high performance number one thing we both have to do is build awareness we have to build awareness around our thoughts build awareness around changes to our bodies i think i see you wearing a whoop i'm wearing a whoop or, yes I, yes yes so we're doing this at an individual level but if you kind of look at what an organization is doing you've got sales leaders that are staring at Salesforce da dashboards, HubSpot dashboards, in spreadsheets, every single metric they're looking at every single day is output related from how many calls a rep is making to length of sales cycle, to sales velocity, to churn rates. Mm -hmm. So this is their only window into performance. So I'm not surprised if you think about a story that gets played over and over and over again on, on the news, we everyone is naturally prone to start thinking this is the most important thing happening in the world because we're giving more attention to it. And this is happening within sales, within sales teams. Sales metrics, sales coaching, sales training, that's all sales leaders have are looking at every single day, which is then creating this urgency to put all of our attention on it. That's how we fix performance. When, when in fact, the stuff that we need to focus on, like we're doing from an individual level, things like sleep, mm -hmm. connection time outside or spending time to play none of that is even on their radar and sure they might do the occasional mps survey or engagement survey that hr is running but these surveys will typically only tell you if there's a problem will people recommend your company are people happy 
are people stressed? It doesn't really help leaders identify, well, if my team is stressed, like what's causing this, right? What's the root cause? So when it comes to finding entry points, that's where I've really sort of been focusing my time recently to help leaders uncover and diagnose what are the biggest aspects of stress and burnout that's impacting your team's mental performance. Mm -hmm. And two, what are all the different levers that that leader has at an individual level that can contribute to offloading and, and, and addressing that stress? And examples of this might be looking at things like like I said, career pathing is a big one when we have that goal and that mm -hmm. sort of thing that we're working towards, that's huge. But how many organizations are struggling with career pathing right now? A ton. Yeah. There's things like financial security is a big one. I was talking to a client the other day and they were like, well, are you saying that we have to pay our people more, more money? Like we can't do that. And I'm like, no, like there's other ways to offer financial security to a young rep that's struggling. Have you mm -hmm. tried you know, run, running an exercise, showing them how to budget and live off their base and how they can reinvest their commission. That's a free strategy that literally yeah. any leader can do to help that seller feel more financially secure without ever paying them more. Mm -hmm. There's things like recognition, like how do you reckon or, or make work more meaningful? Something that drives me nuts that sales teams do is they erase that leaderboard every single quarter or every single month. And all that work that was gone put in is, is is gone so again a very simple strategy start creating lifetime revenue where lead where sellers can see the impact that they're making from day one to the end of their career it's way different when you say oh i miss i missed my quota this month but if i look back at what i've accomplished i've sold two hundred fifty thousand dollars for this company this is just a, a bad beat like keeping that stuff front of mind so Again, these are free strategies, things that leaders can do once they have an idea of what's actually creating stress, which leaders don't have. But that's why I've created sort of a free assessment to help to help teams with that. But mm -hmm. that, those are just some ideas that I've been working through. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good shout, like, because I think that that is is the hurdle there. It's like, it sounds to me like, you know, paying attention to that you know, human side of things is just, it's not really happening as much as it should when it comes to a sales team. And again, not because they don't want to, but maybe because they don't really know how to. So, you know, having a tool like what you have to to kind of address that is really, really about very valuable for sure. Um, so I guess let's say the scenario is, you know, a problem, we want to fix it. What would kind of be the first step, let's say that you would recommend taking? Yeah. So, I mean, again, like getting some data around what's happening within your organization. Like, mm -hmm. again, I, I threw out a bunch of, you know, ideas a few moments ago, but if mm -hmm. your team isn't struggling with recognition or isn't struggling with, you know, career pathing, then starting there isn't going to help. Um, so ultimately it's really important to take a snapshot that provides you with some really good entry points into the areas that you want to focus on. So mm -hmm. that's step one. And then once you have that initial sort of assessment, um, I don't know what you're seeing, but I'd be curious to hear your perspective, but there's just a need right now to upskill both leaders and individual contributors and in how they manage and how they cope with stress. Yes. So there's things that leaders can be doing from their realm to help create this safe environment, but a big piece of where I typically like to start or where I encourage organizations to start is how do you really focus on helping uh, individuals manage stress effectively? Because things that pop up as potential problems, if you think sellers or an entire sales team or a large part of your sales team is saying, well, targets are unachievable. Well, stress is going to impact that perception. So are those targets unachievable because they're actually unachievable or are they unachievable because everyone is super stressed out you, at a very basic level you could say you know you might have a goal that you're working to, working towards on days when you're stressed you're like shit i'm i'm never going to do this i want to give up like this is way out of reach but if you're in, a, in the right headspace you're like, i got this like i'm motivated so it's like all of these things that we're looking at like let's get everyone back to baseline so mm -hmm. that they can actually perceive things around them in, in, in a clear 
as clearly as possible but yes. i don't know are you are, are you seeing um from your end like what where do you think the best starting place is for for an org yeah i i agree with that i think we have to go back to you know the individual a big part of this podcast was kind of to equip you know sales professionals with a bit of tools to to navigate this so that they can come out of every episode with a few uh strategies so I think if we look at it from like a rep perspective, it's obviously like you had mentioned, starting with the awareness piece of like what's happening. So tuning into that with acceptance. And then once we are aware of everything, it's, it's accepting and acknowledging the situation for what it is. So if it's like, okay, you know, this quota is really high, I'm getting stressed out when just observing that noticing that, and then really tuning into the impact that that's having on the body. And that's a lot of the mindfulness work that I do where it's like, okay, my quota is really high. This is stressing mm-hmm. me out. What is this doing to me? How am I showing up because of that? And what are some of these signals that my body's trying to tell me? You know, I'm I'm in this fight or flight state. I'm in this fear state. What does that really mean? And what does that do to me? And, you know, when I'm in this state, how long does that last for? And what is the compound effects of that trickling throughout my day? And, and if I can build awareness around that, I can then begin to regulate it a little bit. And I think it's okay to experience stress. We all will, but it's like, how quickly can you bounce back and and get back to that baseline to your point? So yeah, I think just leaders or, or reps, starting with the individual effort of putting in the work to understand your state and then um, understanding different ways to kind of regulate that. And that's a lot of the work that I do, uh, you know, and, and a lot of the guided meditations and, and work that I do around that are, are to help individuals when they're in that in that situation to, to mm-hmm. come back to that baseline because as you know um and i've referenced this a few times but whether we're getting chased by the tiger or not our body is responding that same way around fear right and and it's um you know at that time creating an environment for us to survive right so our digestive system shuts down our bodily functions are preserved in order to be there and outrun that tiger to survive. And that's what's happening too. And the problem is like a lot of reps and leaders are are consistently in this state, which is obviously leading to the burnout. But the thing I think here is just working on that individual basis, starting with that, and then knowing that that can be inspiration for the team, the trickle effect can be massive on that. So I think you have to look inward to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would, Totally agree. I would also say, I think part of um, something that's really important for leaders to action immediately is um, leading with vulnerability, leading with sort of sharing their stories. Yes. The big thing that I put on leaders' radars all the time is there's really a vulnerability paradox that exists within sales in the sense that, you know, for us to be the best leaders, like we need people to be open and honest with how they're feeling so that we can support them as effectively as possible. Like that needs to exist, but that gets prevented because if you think about a seller and I would, if I were to ask you, like, how likely are you to be vulnerable with someone who's judging your performance every single day? Yeah. The answer is not very likely. Yeah. And as soon as you start to feel more anxious, as soon as that fight or flight response kicks in, that pro-social mindset that you need starts to become more of a fear-based, more defensive mindset. So that's shutting down the willingness of that rep to be vulnerable. So the only way that you can, you know, get around this as a leader and sort of hijack this sort of paradox is leading with vulnerability. It's sharing openly about the struggles that you're going through, not only on like a macro level in terms of what, when you've struggled during your career, but on a micro level every single day where it's like, if you're tired, share that, say, Hey, like kick off your meeting saying, Hey, like if I'm short with you, or if I don't respond to a Slack or Slack message as quickly as possible today, just know nothing is wrong. I'm my newborn just kept me up last night. So these are opportunities every single day to be vulnerable and share how you're feeling, not to overshare, but just being a human and say, mm-hmm. you know, talking about how this is can uh, can can impact your day to day as well man that's such a <clears throat> again another powerful reminder because i think we often make up stories in our head too right it's like oh 
this person is blank because of, but when someone's vulnerable and open, you, you c- can have more compassion, empathy to, to their situation and understanding really as well, which builds connection uh, and will probably increase your relationship, you know, with that individual as well. And I think from a rep's perspective, it, it can be very hard to be vulnerable when you feel like everything you're doing is being judged and could be used against you. Like, you mm-hmm. know, if you have a bad call, like going to your manager and being like, Hey, I, you know, I, I'm not gonna lie. I had a, a very rough call. I'd love to get some feedback on it. Going into that, knowing that that um, feedback will not be held against you as a reflection of your performance, but as a constructive environment to help you improve. I think that that is, is so, so important. So creating that, that safety that, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, as humans, we, we crave, um, safety, right? Like when we do breath work to calm our nervous system, we are creating safety. We're signaling to our body that everything is okay. And mm-hmm. I think at the end of the day, when we don't feel safe, that is the primary issue. And, and if it's a sales environment that is not safe and we don't feel like we can be ourselves and be vulnerable, uh, that inability to create safety has this, uh, you know, effect on the nervous system that, that makes us go into this fight or flight or fear or even free state from that. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I think that's like one of the things that I was sort of two questions that I'd always say, if you're like a seller, that's looking for a job right now, like two questions you absolutely should be asking every single sort of interview you have with, with the new manager. It's like one, um, how are reps treated when they miss target? You don't have to sort of frame it as you're planning to miss target. Be like, hey, like top performer, I've done X, Y, and Z, but everyone misses occasion. Like how reps in your team missing, like how are they treated when they miss target? Mm-hmm. Like, two, like how are you intentionally building trust with your team? Ask a leader like that. And I guarantee the ones that are not equipped to have these conversations won't have a, will stare at you like a deer in, a, deer in the headlights. But the ones that do know, it'll be a no brainer. This is what I'm doing to build trust. And it's such an important piece, like going full circle back to the start of this conversation when I was talking about that performance, uh, you know, experience I had when playing soccer with that team. Like it was um, very, very powerful to my nervous system. And at the time I had no awareness of what that even meant, but that, that, um, that culture of of belief and and an environment where you feel like you can say what you need to say and and Mm -hmm. be vulnerable it goes a long way. And and I think just again, going full circle and kind of wrapping up this theme, it, you're going to get the best out of the individual as well when you can create that. So if, you know, a leader is, is still thinking after this episode, like, well, why, like, who cares? Like this matters because you will get better performance. You will probably get to the number that you need to get to faster So there is this element of that within it just by being, you know, a a good human and showing up and and prioritizing that human element within it. Yeah. And, and that's why to, to your point, I would add like, absolutely. Like all of that stuff will happen when you prioritize mental performance. But even if you, you know, 10% of you thinks, believes in to some degree that, you know, better mental performance leads to better sales performance. If you think that at all, like, like that's why I've created, like I said, this free assessment to say, like, let's just take a look, take a snapshot. Maybe there's no problem and your team is thriving and you're all good, but like, take a look. It's like free. Go pop open the hood and like see what's working and not working. Like, yes, there's so much, there's like so much resistance still to that because I think there's that idea of ignorance being bliss. But if you, if you're trying to fix a broken car and you're not checking the engine, aka the, the the culture and the mental health of your team, well, that car is going to be, continue to re- remain broken, and you're going to have to do a lot of pushing to get it moving. Exactly, I think that's an amazing way to kind of kind of wrap things up as well. And I think that you know there is a lot of, of ignorance around this, but I think that can only go for so long. I think this is now being talked about more than ever. And I think that the momentum is only picking up. So I think for a leader as well, it's, it's, um, you know, uh, a matter of getting ahead of the curve, maybe a little bit here, because this, mm-hmm. this wave is coming. So it's, uh, it's uh, not a matter of if it's a matter of when. So I think there's no better time than now, if you're a leader to, to start paying attention to these things. Um, and, and Jeff, if people want to check out, that resource uh where can they find that 
Yeah, so right now it's just it's linked under by uh, LinkedIn profile. So if you just sort of look at my name, Jeff Risley, R-I-S-E-L-E-Y, uh, you'll be able to find it there. Uh, it'll be up on saleshealthalliance.com shortly, but um, right now it's just being directed from my from my profile. So yeah, check it cool. out. It's, um, it's super accessible. Amazing. And I have checked it out. It is a powerful tool. And uh, also Jeff has a book. Jeff has yeah. uh, a site. Why don't you just maybe just chat about your your offerings a little bit because you've done a lot in this space. Yeah, yeah. So there's a book, a book came out, Stress Less, Sell More, that I finished uh, and was published back in February. So this is like a really practical toolkit, good for book clubs, good for individual sellers or leaders that are looking for ways to offload stress and address stress to, and prevent things like burnout. So it's roughly 220 selling days in a year. So this is going to offer you one strategy for each of those selling days. Love um, that. Th then there's sort of the mental performance assessment piece. And then based off of that assessment, um, how I make money and how sales health lines makes money is through different consulting services and programming to mm -hmm. help address some of those core issues that pop up. If, um, if leaders and teams don't feel comfortable taking them on themselves. Awesome. And I'll include links to that in the show notes so everyone can check that out. But Jeff, it's been a pleasure. It's always a very powerful conversation. And uh, you know, I appreciate your time and your friendship. So thanks for uh, taking the time. Yeah, of course, Damien. Happy to be here and uh, good luck. I'm excited to see the podcast uh, continue to grow. For sure. Thanks, man.